This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode 48, with guest Tanya Lee. Any links and resources you hear in this podcast can be found by going to yourkickasslife.com forward slash 48. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host. The girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. Andrea Owen here about to jump into the interview with Tanya Lee from French Kiss Life. And I am going to introduce you to her right now. And this is going to might be hilarious because you're about to um, listen to me try to um, speak French. (laughs) <laughs> Not really, but here we go. Tanya Lee is the founder and CEO of French Kiss Life Incorporated, a company with a simple mission to inspire women to cultivate lives of ease, elegance, style, and wait for it, joie de vivre. That's my bad French. As a master certified life coach trained by Dr. Martha Beck, she works with highly successful women from around the world who desire to balance ambition with ease to create a fulfilling and meaningful life. With a chic travel society, dynamic programs, a continuously growing international following, and her popular blog, she is changing the way women think about what it truly means and requires to live a luxurious life. She has worked with Oprah and the IKEA Life Improvement Project and spoken to global audiences about entrepreneurship, lifestyle, and other matters of the heart. Although she has an address in Durango, Colorado, you'll often find her sipping on fine wine or tea at a small cafe somewhere in the world, French Kissing Life. Visit TanyaLee.com to learn more and join the French Kiss lifestyle and join the community of other inspiring ladies. So without further ado, here is Tanya Lee. Hey there, ass kickers. Welcome to episode 48 of the Your Kick-Ass Life podcast. We are so excited to be talking to Mademoiselle Tanya Lee of French Kiss Life. And hello, Tanya. Hi, Andrea and everyone. It's so great to be here. Yeah, we're so excited to have you because I was telling Tanya before we started recording that we've been both kind of watching each other from afar for years. And it's so funny how small this world is, but how far apart we actually are. So to actually get on the phone and be able to jam together, it's it's so fun. So welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to jam with you. And do we call your community the ass they're kickers? The, they're my ass kickers. Yes, I love they are. it. I love it. <laughs> I French kiss life and you kick ass. I'll I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> sounds definitely like some kind of rock and roll song, but I love it. <laughs> Which kind of brings me to my very first question is, um, I love the name of your company is French Kiss Life. And so, and I'm sure you get this question a lot as I get the question, what does your kick-ass life actually mean? But I would love for you to tell us in your own words, what French Kissing Life to you means and what is your mission for women? Mm, Such a great question. And I like to explain it by the experience that actually uh, was the birth of French Kiss Life. You know, I went to Paris about 10 years ago and like many women, I was so overwhelmed. I was overweight. I was struggling with my body. I was just struggling with life. I was quite a miserable chick at the time. And I remember I was in the Luxembourg Garden and I was just walking around and I just started noticing how people seemed to be moving through their day. I mean, there were people lounging, reading books. There were lovers kissing. There were moms playing with their kids. And out of my mouth flew the words, oh my God, these people are French kissing life. Mm -hmm. And it was like the light bulb went off and I'm like, you know what? This is what I want for myself. I want to really be able to enjoy my everyday. I want to be able to go after what I want with ease, not the pushing and striving and chasing, which is the way I had been approaching my life. And so I came home on a mission. Uh, to really seek quality, to make every day as beautiful as possible, and at the same time, go to forward to, towards my dreams. You know, I have the saying, um, I want the journey to the dream to be as beautiful as the dream itself. And so my mission for women is to really inspire them to live with more ease, more passion, and more joie de vivre in their everyday life. Oh, I love that. It's just, it's, um, and that's really coincides so much with what your kick-ass life is. And, you know, I get that question all the time, too. And it's really not about – and I'm going to ask you about this, too. And it's really not about – 
for me, it's like not about kissing ass every single or kicking ass. I should say not kissing ass. That would be a combination of our, of our brands. It's not about kicking ass like every single moment of every day. And, and I assume that's kind of what you're saying. Like life is still, life still happens, but it's, you know, not getting sucked all the way down into it and not, cause it sounds like where you were. And I'm making this up, but it sounds like you were kind of maybe feeling a little bit victim-y, like, oh my God, my life sucks. <laughs> Poor I'm me. such a victim, yeah. such a victim. And it's amazing when you change your perspective, how your life changes. And I remember I was waking up every day with a war going on in my head. And now it's like life is a playground. And it's only because I shifted my perspective, nothing else changed. Mm-hmm. And so it's like when you can really do that shift, you begin to see opportunities that you were unable to see before. You begin to see challenges as ways to grow Mm -hmm. and become more of who you want to be and not use it as an excuse that life is happening to me. But wow, life is happening for me. What am I going to do with this? How am I going to make this fun? How am I going to turn this challenge into a victory? So it becomes like this really fun game. Yeah. Well, it comes down to choice. And it's what's what's interesting is that when you said that, it made me think of just a couple of hours ago, I was irritated about something and I left, I left my best friend Amy a message about it and I'll, I'll grumbly about something. And she, (laughs) she responds and she's like, well, I mean, another perspective could be that. And and I was kind of like all a little bit irritated that she said it. And I was like, well, she's actually right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) A lot of it also is who you surround yourself with, because if you're surrounding yourself with people who are colluding and encouraging your, um, the perspective that you're stuck in, you're probably going to stay there a lot longer. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it's amazing for me as I've changed my perspective and really, you know, we use the term like vibration, but as my energy has started vibrating differently, all those complainers and the victims that I used to hang out with, they just started falling mm-hmm. by the wayside. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, they're gone. Yeah. And I re- it's not like I made a decision one day. I'm getting rid of everyone. It's just like it happened. It does tend to happen organically because those people aren't ready for where you're at and it's uncomfortable for them and nobody wants to usually stay where they're uncomfortable. So yeah, it just tends to organically stay away. I have experienced that as well. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because happiness can irritate the hell out of people. Yep. People that don't want it. <laughs> they yes, say that they, they do, the but truth. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's easy for, for you and I to say all that and, you know, oh my God, yeah, just change your perspective. It's so great. And which brings me to the other thing I wanted to ask you about, because I spent a fair amount of time on your blog. And um, one of my favorite posts that you had written was, the title of it is, My Life is Perfect, The Real Truth. And you talk about, I love the in that you talk about the real everydayness of your life. And I love the part where you asked, um, you know, if people probably ask you if your life is perfect because you're beautiful, you know, you have, you're an entrepreneur, you work from home and you said yes and no. And I'm going to quote you. You say the way to create a quote unquote perfect life is to see how perfect your life is right now. So can you talk about this and how you practice seeing how perfect your life is right now? Yeah, well, you know, your mind is such a powerful tool. And, you know, before my epiphany um, in Luxembourg Gardens, I was so accustomed to looking at what was wrong in my life. And it still happens. I'm not perfect at this. It's such a journey. And there's still days I wake up and I'm like, oh, God, Mm -hmm. this is Mm -hmm. the most imperfect day ever. But it's really interesting when you learn to train your mind to look for how your life is so beautiful and so abundant and so incredible how you began to actually see the perfection of your life. You know, I have a 17, almost 17 year old daughter. You know, we have drama in our house. I have kids overeating all the time. My house gets messy. Like I'm still living uh, uh, what many people would consider to be an imperfect life. But because my perception around it has changed, it's interesting. I am able to actually create more space in my life for what I call the non-essentials. And the non-essentials are taking the time to light a candle. It takes all of like two seconds. Mm -hmm. Or taking the time to, I drink champagne on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Like I just do because I, you know, I love to celebrate midweek. But my life is still crazy. It's still crazy. It still has all the stuff that everyone has. But a lot of people look at my life and they're like, oh my God, it's so perfect. You travel to Paris. And I'm like, listen, it's not, that is an illusion because I still live in the daily mess of what every woman lives with. But I just tend to see the mess is like really beautiful. It's Mm -hmm. just part of life. 
Oh, I I want to marry that, what you just said. I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And it's so funny. You know, I, I had um, a similar moment that you did. I wasn't in Paris, though. I was I was in a heap on the floor of my empty apartment where I had my kind of moment of awakening many yeah. years ago. But <laughs> I just, um, yeah. And it's interesting because when I started my healing, uh, my, my circumstances didn't immediately change. It wasn't like I got handed a million dollars or like a hot boyfriend. And then I was like, okay, now I can change my perspective. It was for me, it was, and it sounds like this is similar to what happened to you. It was like, okay, this situation sucks that I'm in, but I can choose to change my life and focus on what is good or stay in that this sucks. And for anyone that's listening, like, I just sort of feel like, everybody sort of has their limit to suffering. Like wherever you draw the line in the sand is wherever you draw the line in the sand. And I, I believe that some people can take a lot of shit before, <laughs> before they draw yeah. that line. But you don't have to wait until you hit like a complete rock bottom. Like it, whatever it is for you. But I, I think anyone has the power to change their perspective and to look for beauty in the world. Like I don't know about you, but like I just posted this on Instagram yesterday. I was kind of introducing myself to all my new followers and I was like – just some random things about me. I love people so fucking much. I sometimes feel like my heart's going to explode. I just, yeah. there's so much beauty in humans. Mm-hmm. I can't stand it. I just I can't. Know. <laughs> I know. And I mean, I'm about to cry as you're talking about that because, you know, we turn on the media and if we get on Facebook, it seems like sometimes like we like to highlight the sh- dark shadows of people. But, you know, one of my things is I think Rumi is the one that said, what you seek is seeking you. And when I'm around people, I just want to seek goodness. I want to seek the beauty in every person that I meet. And what's interesting is that as you begin focusing upon that, how you draw it out of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same reason why when you're with someone and you have instant chemistry and you fall in love, you're only looking for incredible things in that person. But over time, have you ever noticed how you start to see their falls and you start to pick on it? It could be the demise of a great relationship. And so it's like really training yourself to look for what you want to see because it's there. Mm-hmm. It's always there. It's always available to you. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I love that. And I think that too, touching on um, the topic we were talking about are, you know, finding the ways to create a perfect life. And I've mentioned this before on my podcast, I think, but I think it's worth mentioning it again. And like, especially if there are moms out there, you know, and, and not that our life is harder, but it's definitely an, a unique kind of situation where it's easy to fall into the, oh my gosh, this is hard. I have so many things to do. I mean, the paperwork alone that comes home from elementary school <laughs> to me is like, I need an assistant just to deal with that. <laughs> you know? Right. The correspondence. And, and the, the fundraisers. And, oh yeah. yeah. But I think that for me, I what I focus on, and I, I see this a lot in, in self-help and, you know, the whole being present and seizing the moment and enjoying every single moment while our kids are young and things like that, that stresses me the hell out. Like that mm-hmm. makes me panicked. And what I do to shift that, and this is what me, makes me feel like my life is so amazing, is I look for moments and they are so small and quick, but they are profound and in impactful. So for instance, like sitting at the dinner table and I make sure that the four of us eat together, myself, my husband, and my two kids that are seven and five, by the way, if you don't, if we're listening, you didn't know, but you know, I, I, I watch them and I watch them talking to each other and I watch, um, I mean, even so my, my kids, every once in a while still take a bath together. And I was in the other room listening to them play and stuff. And then Sydney, my daughter says, Colton, I have an itch on my, um, in the middle of my back. Can you itch it for me? And I'm listening to them. And, and then it's like quiet for a second. And she goes, thank you. And it's just like that interaction to me was so beautiful to watch ch- my children that are siblings. Like I didn't have siblings like that. So like heart explosion, like just yeah. total. It's just the smallest of moments that can seem insignificant, but these to me are the most significant. Oh, they do. And that's so true. You know, I remember um, when my daughter was probably two, this was when I was like a hot mess. Mm-hmm. And I was always like too busy, too busy. And I remember like, pulling a book off the shelf because she wanted me to read to her every night. And I would try to find the shortest book that I could get through the quickest. Yeah. (laughs) And I cannot tell you, like, just talking about how it just makes my heart so sad to think about I was too busy to read to her 
in such a way that would create memories for both of us. And, you know, that's another part of French kissing life. It's like really, as you just so eloquently said, it's really slowing down to appreciate those just everyday ordinary moments. Mm -hmm. But when you look at them a certain way, well, you realize it's their extraordinary. Those are the kinds of memories that your 90 year old self is going to be like, whoa, Mm -hmm. I want more of those. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I think about my own parents and, you know, I did not care that my mom, that my parents didn't throw extravagant birthday parties for me. Or I remember that my mom cannot hear music without dancing. Still to this day, and she's in her 70s, you know, but I remember her dancing all the time in her kitchen while she was cooking, while she was doing anything. And I remember my parents kissing, like when they didn't think that I was looking. And um, those are the things that I remember about my parents. You know, it's not, it's not that she could make like a Pinterest, you know, <laughs> A wallpaper decor or anything like that. But those are like those little tiny ordinary moments. So profound. Yeah, absolutely. So one of one of the other things that that um, that you had written about and that um, I know that some of my audience struggles with is over apologizing. And so you had written a post when um, I feel like you really hit the nail on the head when you talk about what women are really saying when they're apologizing for things that they don't really need to be apologizing for. And you said um, they're saying things like, I'm not good enough. Uh, don't ruffle any feathers. Keep the peace. Don't take up too much space. Be quiet and say little. Please everyone but yourself. So I'm, I'm curious a cu- about a couple of things is, is what prompted you to write the article and, um, and just what your, what your general thoughts are around that. Well, being the quintessential Southern girl, I was raised to be apologetic about everything. Oh and my gosh. <laughs> kind of find out, like, especially my Canadian readers, they're like, oh my God, that's such a Canadian quality as well. Mm-hmm. Like, Canadians I didn't are very nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I just, um, what prompted it is that I felt whenever I would apologize, if it wasn't warranted, how it made me feel. It was like, wow, I am putting myself in a space to feel really small. And again, I'm not good enough. And it would be something as simple, like someone would run into me and I would apologize. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I was taking up too much space. I got in your way. And so for me, it was just like, I noticed not only myself, but the women that I was around just was apologizing for everything and what it really meant. And I just felt so compelled to give women permission to don't apologize for things that don't need apologizing for, such as your period. You know what? Mm -hmm. When you're on your period, you can be cranky. You can be a bitch. You can be hormonal. And you also can take responsibility for your emotions, but you don't need to apologize for it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if the waiter brings you the wrong plate of food, you don't need to apologize. You just simply need to ask for what you want. And so it's been a very empowering process for me to stop apologizing and to be really fascinated when I do and what it's really saying about how I feel about myself. Mm -hmm. It seems like such a small thing to to stop saying the words, I'm sorry, when you're not, when you have no reason to be sorry. But it, it, like you said, it's, it's powerful. And I think it's so impactful to your spirit. And, and really, um, and, and you may have written this in the post, I can't remember, but I, a, a great replacement for that is excuse me. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. It's, two two know, words again. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Um, and then asking for what you want or excuse me. Or sometimes I will just say, excuse you. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's interesting. Like one of the hardest ones for me when you mentioned that is being at a restaurant. So I... I don't know what it is about sending food back. I, and I've never worked in a restaurant before. So I, it's, I, it's not, I don't know. I just feel like I, maybe I don't want to wait anymore for the food, but that's really hard for me. And it's interesting. We, we, there's like this local, like family steakhouse that my kids love going there. It's the kind where it's not fancy. It's the kind where like you can eat the peanuts and you can like throw the shells on the ground. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. My kids love it. And it's, it's good food. So we go there quite often and, Um, I ordered, I always order good steak and I ordered a steak and it came to the table and I'm looking at it and there was a ton of fat on it. And I'm like, this doesn't look right. But, you know, I started eating it and I could like barely even cut it with the steak knife. And my husband's like, that just doesn't look right at all. And I'm thinking, I should probably send this back, but I didn't want to. And so I finally did. And I, and I told her, I said, I didn't say I was sorry. And I just said, uh, but I did say, which I didn't need to, but I did say, I hate to be the kind of person that does this. (laughs) That is like my way of apologizing. But as it turns out, 
She took it back and brought me a new one. And she came back and she apologized. And she said, I put your order in wrong. Mm. <laughs> you actually got the wrong steak. And I was like, oh. But it's it's really interesting even for me too. And I, same, I was a chronic apologizer. Um, but still, every once in a while, you know, I slip back and into old behaviors. So I, that's just a reminder to y'all that – you know, even I, and I'm speaking for myself, but I, maybe you can relate to Tanya. Every once in a while, I'll fall back onto an old behavior and, and have to check myself before I wreck myself. Yeah, I think we all do. It's the part of being human. It's the beauty of being human. Mm-hmm. This is not about being perfect. It's about just recognizing your patterns and being fascinated by them. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole apology thing, I think it really just, it's such a metaphor for your entire life. You know, where are you afraid to ask for what you want without apology? Yeah. You know, where are you afraid to say, you know what, you know, this is what I need right now. And when you can begin to just really step into that space, it's amazing what happens, not only, as you said, to your spirit, but to the opportunities that sometimes just fall into your lap just by saying, saying, this is what I want. Yeah, well, and I think it really speaks to the messages that we hear growing up. And I think not not only in the South, but I think everywhere in the American culture, uh, what I hear a lot from from my, my audience and myself, too, is that most of us grew up hearing that we were too much of something. You know, mm-hmm. we, were, we were too loud. We were too opinionated, <clears throat> too aggressive, too shy, too something. And so in order for us to kind of fall into this category of, of being not too much of something, then we stay small. And I think part of staying small is apologizing and staying quiet. And, you know, like you were saying, like not ruffling any feathers or rocking the boat. Well, I actually have a really great story, if you don't mind me sharing it, because it's around this topic. So I was at a networking event probably a couple years ago, and we were all standing around talking, and (laughs) this woman in the group, there was probably like five or six of us talking, she just looked at me and she was like, you're just way too feminine. Wow. Because I am. But when she said it, I could feel my whole body just contract. I literally Mm -hmm. wanted to run to the bathroom and take off my high heels and my lipstick and really make myself small. And but I didn't. I was just like, oh, I didn't even know what the perfect comeback was for that. I was sort of like dumbfounded. And so the first thing that came to me is according to whom? I couldn't even come up with that. I was just like, what? No one had ever said that to me. Hmm. And I was speaking with a male friend of mine later that evening who happens to be a coach. And I was just sharing with him what this woman had said. And he was like, Tanya, he's like, I'm going to challenge you to dial it up 100% over the weekend. And I was like, really? He was like, yeah, it's who you are. Do not dial it down, dial it up. Mm -hmm. And so I did. It was sort of an experiment. And by the end of that event, the woman came up to me and apologized. And she said, you know what? I was really rude to you. And she said, what it really was is you have something that I wanted. And she ended up becoming a client. And (laughs) I think about had I dialed it down, her and I would not have been able to have this connection. And I so just appreciated her honesty and her courage to come up to me and apologize. And it ended up in a very beautiful conversation. So whatever you think you're too much of, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you to dial it up 100%. Mm -hmm. That is a big challenge, (laughs) (laughs) right? Yes. I've, I've, um, for me, I was always told like, you're, you're too opinionated. I've been told you're too smart for your own good. You're too loud. I've been to- told I'm too loud so many times. And yeah, to, it took me until I was probably in my mid thirties to really embrace that and just, and still, I still have moments of like, Oh, maybe that was offensive to someone. And, um, I wanted to, to tag on to what you just said too, because when you told that story, it reminded me of um, I facilitate the work of Dr. Brene Brown. It's called The Daring Way. And, and one of the exercises in there, and this is a common exercise actually, is to, to have a mantra that allows you to remind yourself to stick to your personal values. And Brene says that hers is don't shrink, don't puff up, stand your sacred ground. So in any kind of situation like the one that you were in, where, I mean, because that could send you into a, a shame spiral depending on you know, like what messages you heard as a kid or whatever circumstances you're in, like that could have run pretty deep. And so if anyone's listening and you um, are in that situation where someone says something to you that, you know, strikes a flame (laughs) inside of you before you respond or before you act, 
have mm-hmm. a little mantra that you say to yourself. And, and I love Brene's. Mine's a little bit different. Um, but it just, it takes courage, I think, to stand your sacred ground. Because I'm sure for you, if you would have shrunk and dialed it down, you were not holding on to your values. Or if you would have lashed back and said something rude, rude back, that's not who you are either. So I think it's important to, like, in those moments of... Um, being afraid, really, you know, because I, I make up that that's maybe what you were feeling, you know, when you um, had her say that to you, of, is to have yeah. a, a little mantra. Well, it was fear and humiliation because she mm-hmm. said it in front of a group of people. So, yes, there was a lot of shame. And I, you know, my thing with shame is you will continue to be triggered until you heal it and accept Mm -hmm. it. And so every time I feel shame, it's like, wow, I still have a lot of healing to do around this. And then you'll notice it's healed because someone will say something that used to trigger you and it no longer has any power over you. Mm -hmm. So now if someone calls me too feminine, I just sort of laugh because it's true. I am. (laughs) You say thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Awesome. I'm getting it right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing too with shame is that, and I could talk about shame all day long, which, you know, I know a lot of people don't like to talk about shame, but... (laughs) But I think too, um, I lost my train of thought here for a second, darn it. But I got too excited about talking about shame. But I think, oh, it was about the healing part. And uh, one part of shame resilience that is really important is telling your story. So if you weren't healed or even on the road to healing um, from that, you would have never told that story to really anyone, let alone on a public forum like this. Yeah, I have so many shame stories. <laughs> so, so do many. I, sister. I mean, so do I. <laughs> going up at trailer parks, gaining 75 pounds, having an eating disorder. And it's really interesting. I think the more you give yourself permission to talk about them and to really own them and accept them in a safe space, you do create the the sacred space to heal them. Mm-hmm. I think shame's like the boogeyman in the closet. We try to lock it away and turn the lights off and ignore it. And you know, it's like, just turn the lights on and have a posse of people beside you to support you as you do. And it really will dissolve. It really will. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's powerful stuff. Really, really powerful stuff. Okay. I'll have to have you back on and we'll have it. We'll have a whole (laughs) talk just about shame. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, you, another post that you wrote that I loved is you came up with, and you guys, for anyone listening, I keep mentioning Tanya's blog posts that are amazing. So if you, um, and all of the show notes from this episode are at yourkickasslife.com forward slash four eight, and that will take you to these individual blog posts that I'm mentioning and uh, as well as to Tanya's site. But you've come up with 23 ways to be miserable. So can you (laughs) name us a few of your, you know, and I'm using air quotes over here. Can you name us a few of your favorites? Oh my God, they're all so good. (laughs) Uh, You're like, not to toot my own horn or anything. I'm such a good writer. (laughs) I know, they're all so, I'm so awesome. I wrote so many good ones. Um, So the first one would have to be the best which is decide that you can only be happy when other people behave differently. Oh my God. That was me. (laughs) That was me for like 29 years. (laughs) Yes. You change your behavior and then I'll be happy. It is the perfect recipe. And they'll be happier too. They just don't know it yet. (laughs) Yeah. But you all need to be miserable until someone changes. (laughs) That would definitely be my favorite. And that one has caused me the most misery of all of them probably. Let's see, what is the other one? Probably the second one, which is only do things when you think you're ready. Unicorns are flying oh, yeah. around and angels are appearing is the perfect way to create misery for yourself. Because if that's how you go through life, you will never be ready. You know, I think the more you do, the more you experiment, the more you play in life, the more confidence you gain, the more opportunities that come your way and things really do begin to fall into place. Mm -hmm. You cannot wait until you feel ready or you'll never do anything. Absolutely. Okay. Give us one more. One more. Um, And this goes back to the first post that we were talking about. Uh, Only focus on what you think is wrong in your life. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like focus go there 24 7 yeah and fix it like really f- focus on fixing all of your problems all at once and I all that I truly believe that no one has created a better life by beating themselves up or and or focusing mm-hmm. on what's all going wrong yeah no one. yeah I don't I can't think of anyone either <laughs> 
<laughs> we know everyone, by the way. What's your favorite? I'm curious. <laughs> well, and I, I love, okay, so I want to touch on the second one that you were talking about, um, about starting before you're ready. And this is something that I, I think I've always known, but again, Dr. Brene Brown articulated it so well. And every time I say it, somebody comes to me and says, thank you for saying that because I didn't know, is the fact that we can be courageous and afraid at the exact same time in the exact same moment every day. Yeah. And yeah. I I was under the assumption for so long that you were either brave or you were afraid. So you had to become courageous or confident to do all of these things. So I, I looked to women like you, you know, 10, 10 years ago, I looked to women like you and thinking like, okay, well, she must have gotten her life together once she gained the confidence and courage to do so. <laughs> and that is not true. It is absolutely not true. And so I love the, the whole notion of of begin before you're ready and and it's that famous John Wayne quote that I love and and courage is about feeling the fear and saddling up anyway yeah I think about Oprah she said you know every person she ever interviewed from you know murderers to Beyonce at the end of the interview they all asked the same question was that okay <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's like, we think all of these people have it together or not. But, you know, it's not about waiting for confidence. Confidence comes as you allow yourself to screw up, make mistakes. I went to sommelier school. And Thank I'll never you. Wait, forget- I just want to stop you for a second. Because okay. I've been saying that for so long. And <laughs> I'm so glad someone else is saying it. Yes, confidence comes it as comes you through- go. <laughs> yeah, it comes through practice and and. uh action and just doing those things that scare you most. I mean, I will tell this real quick story and I'll be done with my storytelling, but it's actually a really funny one. So I grew up in the South in trailer parks, didn't, was never exposed to the world of wine, but there was something in me. I wanted to learn about wine. And so I went to Samoye school the very first day of class. I'm sitting there and my experience with wine at the time had been white Zinfandel and Boone's Farm, Farm, Strawberry Hill, Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill. (laughs) That's all I knew about wine. So I'm in this room with all of these wine connoisseurs and the sommelier asked, what is your favorite wine? And me, Miss Eager Beaver raises my hand and I'm like, I love rose wine. (laughs) Oh no. And the whole class just burst into laughter and looked at me like I was insane. Like, what is she doing here? But here's the thing. I ended up graduating top of my class. I went on to become a food and wine writer. And, you know, I had to be willing to look really stupid and to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I built my confidence. And so allow yourself to make mistakes. That's the only way you're going to learn. Yeah, it's so true. And when you were saying that story, it made me think of, um, you know, people, and I'm sure you get this question a lot, and, and this industry that we're in, in life coaching, and it's exploded over the last few years. And I get asked all the time, you know, like, what's the secret? And if you could name one thing that's helped you so much, and I have to, I have to break it down to three words, and it's patience, perseverance, and hustle. And it's funny, because right before this call, I was thinking about perseverance. And it really, like, for me, I... I had doubts all over the place, but the big picture of it was like, I just it was like, there's just no way it's not going to work out. There's just not, I just, it's, mm-hmm. it's going to work out. And I was afraid and I screwed up and I made mistakes and it was, you know, it was one client at a time, one relationship at a time over, over the months and years. And, but yeah, if I had waited until I knew everything and had all the resources and had all the confidence and courage, I, I still, I still would be working in corporate America. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So it's patience, perseverance and hustle. And hustle. It's so true. Work. There's no, there's no blueprint for making six figures in a weekend. Like we see online. Wink, wink. <laughs> there's no formula for anything. We're all so unique and individual and it's really about you cultivating your own formula. It but is. I love those three pillars because you're so right. If you have patience, if you have belief, and I think that's where the trust comes in Mm -hmm. and you're willing to work and you're willing to make mistakes, it's all going to fall together for you. It will. It absolutely will. It will. And I think like two other things that are really important if anybody's like on the edge of their seat and and interested in, in that and what Tanya and I do for a living, I think another two huge parts of it are working on your own stuff because mm-hmm. being an entrepreneur for me and a lot of people that I talk to will bring up your own shit 100 fold. Yeah. If you want a self help workshop, start your own business. <laughs> I'll bring it all Best up. Personal development program <laughs> in the world. Right. In the world. 
<laughs> and and having a support system. And I don't I mean systems, yes, but I mean like um friends and especially colleagues that know what you're going through and can support you and not just give you advice, but just say like wow, I, I saw that that happened and that really sucked and I'm here for you. Just that kind of support. And that goes for life too. But I think in business, it's it's equally imperative. Yeah. You know, my favorite mantra, well, I have a couple, but one is there is no hurry. Because mm-hmm. I find when I'm in a hurry, it's like there's that desperation, there's that panic. And the other one is actually there's nothing serious going on. Right? Ever. There's ever. not. There's not. I worked as a critical care nurse and I was with people on their deathbed. And even in that moment, there was nothing serious going on. It was a, it was part of life, you know? And so I just remind myself, even when things aren't going the way I think they should, I'm like, wow, there's really nothing serious going on. And just that mindset shift, I'm able just to take some deep breaths and look at what's before me mm-hmm. and handle it. So yeah, I know one of my one of my mantras too when I'm in those moments of like, oh my gosh, there's still seven things on my to do list, and my kids are home and I have to make dinner. I just always tell myself like, I'll figure it out. Like, yeah, nothing has ever been such a disaster and a crisis where the world is falling apart around me because I still have to make images for my class. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> These are good problems to have, right? <laughs> oh, right? No, not a crisis. Yeah. But you make it yeah. up. Again, it's that whole you're at choice. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so I thank you so much. That went by so fast, and I could talk to you all day long, and I'm sure my listeners would. would I'm, I'm definitely for sure we're going to talk about shame. I'm holding you to that, Tanya. <laughs> yeah, I would love to because I have a lot of shame stories and examples of how I've been able to to heal the shame. Like you, I love talking about shame because then I it do. Makes it- power. I think I'm at a place and I'm not saying, I do want to say real quick too, that I, I'm not saying that I think everyone should go out and tell their shame stories publicly. Like people are, might be listening to this, like clutching the arm of their chair and going like, oh my God, no, please, Andrea, don't tell us to do that. No. But I think for myself, and I, I think I can speak for Tanya here that I feel honored that I can come to this place or my blog or it be interviewed by other people and share my shame stories because I have gotten to a place where I have practiced shame resilience and I have the tools and have done the work on them. So I'm at a place now where I can talk about them. So just keep in mind, you guys listening, that this is a process and and Tanya and I live in this world of personal development. So I I think absolutely it's possible. I've seen miracles happen for people and um, I I do it – Two reasons. I do it as a service to other people and I do it for my own selfish therapeutic needs. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, and, and you, you raise such a good point. Um, people need to be aware of who they share their shame stories with. Yes. And do it in a very sacred space where you can have healing mm-hmm. and not actually deepen the shame. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yes. And Brene tells us it's, it's, Shame resilience is about sharing the right story with the right person at the right time. Yeah. And those three things are important. Yay. Well, let's do a shame segment. Yay. Shame. (laughs) We will. All right. Well, that being said, again, you guys, um, yourkickasslife.com forward slash 48. And if you want to tell the listeners now, Tanya, what is the best way for them to go and find out more about you directly? Oh, you can go to my blog, tanyalee.com. You can come say hi on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I love connecting with the community. And also, I started the French Kiss Life Club recently, which is a free club just for women to get together and celebrate life. So you can also check us out there. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. And you guys, we are still in open registration for the Kick-Ass Courage Project, The Experience, which is 30 days of practicing courage. And if you just go to 30dayexperience.com to register, Uh, we start on April 1st. And so with that, I bid you farewell and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. 